Okay, so as I say, this is intro uh, or the history of literary theory, which I've been teaching now for uh, 16 years, but not, sorry, every other year for the last 16 years. So eight times this is my eighth time teaching this course. And I put it on the syllabus um, in part because literary theory is my thing. It's one of my areas of academic expertise. Unlike Shakespeare or C.S. Lewis, which I lecture on and I have interest in, but I'm not academically, um, I haven't done the academic research into it, whereas lit theory is more my uh, metier, my uh, area of expertise. So I wrote a book uh, years ago that came out in 2004, I think it was 2004, uh, Romanticism, Hermeneutics, and the Crisis of the Human Sciences, this terrible not my choice, by the way. That's the publisher. Uh, insisting because it's keyword searches for libraries because they said this is a book for libraries. I thought, great, okay. Uh, truthfully, it is a book for libraries. It's not one that you want to read. Uh, and my wife famously, when she heard the title, laughed, told her sister, and then she laughed. And then they both had to look up the word hermeneutics. I'm like, what the heck's this? <laughs> Anyway, well, I was very bright, by the way, but just hermeneutics, like what is this? What a terrible mouthful, which is what I thought when they suggested the title. And I said, how about we call it The Selfish Genius? Because Richard Dawkins wrote a book called The Selfish Gene, and I want to respond in some ways to, the na to naturalism. And they said, that's very clever. Yes, why don't you do that? But you'll have to go elsewhere to do that. Yeah, another publisher, and I was like, okay. All right, so I guess it'll be romanticism, hermeneutics, and the crisis of the human sciences. Anyway, uh, I am uh, wittering here and going off topic. Uh, this uh, course and history of lit theory is there to remedy something of what traditional lit theory classes tend to do, which is to look at contemporary, that is 20th century literary theory and 21st century. And that's all they look at. And they don't look at what was uh, the views of, liter of what literature is and what it means to read a text that existed prior to that. And in my view, th the consequence of that is th it's like a dog chasing its tail and they never get anywhere and they reiterate the same problems and can't find solutions to problems which they themselves have created by the way that they're looking at literature. So the problem is, is endemic in the discipline of literary theory. And I found the exact same thing when I came to the study of the Romantic period. And the Romantics, as anyone who studied the Romantics knows, were revolutionaries in the way that they looked at literature. And if you go, having said that, to most modern literature departments, even in the classics, they have on the, and you'll find that near bookstores, the, under classics you have Jane Austen and Dickens and so forth. So in other words, 19th century literature and onwards, the classics are 19th century. They don't deal with texts written before the 19th century by and large, or the rise of the novel. Uh, which is, for my, to me, a terrible thing. A and it's also uh, not just that I prefer older texts, it's that the, the presuppositions of the older texts are very, very different than those which were written by the Romantics and their successors, namely us. So if you're ever going to look at a text differently and to consider, even as a, th a theoretical consideration, which one is correct, which one is the most helpful, which is the best way of engaging with a text, you want something that will be able to provide a little bit of competition and not simply share the presuppositions of the Romantics. And, but contemporary literary theories all share the presuppositions of the Romantics. And they lead to what, um, it's, a, it's an old Greek word, but, uh, and it was used of uh, Socrates and what he would leave his interlocutors with, and that was with an aporia, which is, there's no way out. He led them down a blind alley and they could not get out. And so if you ever read a dialogue by Plato, Socrates starts by with this witty dialogue, banter back and forth, and it's not long before Socrates' opponents are stuttering and saying, yes, Socrates, of course, Socrates, you're right, Socrates, indubitably, what else could it be, so that sort of thing. Because the, all of the objections have been silenced. 
So he leads them until they get to the point where they contradict themselves and they're aware that they've contradicted themselves and then they shut up. Modern contem or contemporary literary theories do more or less the same thing. They lead to uh, blind alleys in which you can't get out and then they rage about it. Um, so uh, con the, the classical literary theories we're going to look at, I think, offer a larger vantage point and uh, a richer one. Uh, so one of the things I'm going to do on the course is I'm going to look at literature in terms of uh, sort of more or less an Aristotelian way in terms of four causes. So I, for those of you who've done philosophy, you'll particularly warm to the course because it is more of a philosophical way of looking at literature. There's no doubt about it. And I'm going to look at causality, not in Aristotle's sense, but in the sense of when he talks about the initial cause, I'm going to speak of the, the author. And when he talks about the, um, uh, the uh, material cause and the instrumental cause, I'm going to talk about the texts. And then when I, he talks about the final cause, I'm going to talk about the audience. Who is it for? Who wrote it? What was the intention of the author? What's, what is the text? Those are the two middle causes. And then the final cause, the audience. What we find in contemporary literary theory is they cut out the initial cause and the final cause. They don't consider the mind of the author or the audience, those things they exclude. And what you're left with then are simply the instrumental or the material causes. In other words, the text. You have a text without an author. The author's intentions are irrelevant to the text. In fact, they call it a fallacy to refer to the author's intentions and a fallacy to refer to the purpose of the text. And the result of that is that literary theory denatures literature and treats it like some sort of object. And it's not very helpful. And it kills the delight that many people have in reading. And so I have always resisted the uh, suggestion, which we have had in-house, about whether we should introduce this course and its material early on, like first year English. And I said, we will not over my dead body will we do that. And the reason why is because I think you would you drop the course and you would hate and you would hate English. I would like you to read Shakespeare and love Shakespeare and read Milton and love Milton and read Austin and love Austin and read the text for themselves and not for what a theoretical perspective says about this. Like what's the, you know, what's the feminist version of Hamlet? What, what's the feminist take on Hamlet or Lear? There are our feminist take, or what's the post-colonial take on, uh, on the Tempest? All of those are very common in modern theories. Or, or what's the queer theoretical vantage point on the cross-dressing that takes place in many of Shakespeare's comedies. What, what is that? And how do we read the text then? And I think those are all well and good, but ultimately those are agendas, contemporary agendas being foisted on the text. And then you never actually take the text and allow the text to speak to you and allow it to change you. You're always basically domineering the text from whatever vantage point even if it's a marginalized one. You're effectively empowering the reader or the audience over the text. And I don't like that. It's like, why? That's, when I read literature, I do it because I take delight in that world. And I want to take delight in that world. And I don't want to be making it an agenda at all times. If you want to do that, go into politics. You know, get out of the classroom, go into politics. That's your thing by all means. So my thesis is that uh, great literature presents a, a moral realism which uh, speaks of freedom and dignity. That's my view of literature in general. It speaks of a freedom, there's a freedom and there's a dignity in, in great works of literature in the moral realism, of, let's say, of the Bible, of, of Homer, of you name it of Shakespeare, there's a moral realism. We recognize the moral nature of the characters. We think it's realistic. 
there's, the, uh, there's a dramatic portrait of human life or uh, nature going on there, and it's, per it's persuasive, and it speaks powerfully, and it's transformative in some ways. And that's why we go back and keep reading it, because it really has that effect on it. It's like you, you know that character. Like, if you like Jane Austen, you, you, you have strong views on Lizzie Bennet. Right? Or, you, or you have a Hamlet, you have strong views on Prince Hamlet and how he should be portrayed. And if he's portrayed differently, you're up in arms about the fact that you know, he's been portrayed as a woman or something like that. There's a female Hamlet or something like that bothers you intensely because these characters are your friends, more or less. There, there is a sense that you've uh, done something wrong to that character, even if it's a fictional character. But contemporary literary theory has done exactly that. It has denatured the texts, and it has, uh, uh, it's reduced the text to simply words on a page. It's, it's removed the moral realism. It's removed the sense of human freedom and the possibility of freedom and the terrible consequences of human freedom, which result in tragedy or in great moments of celebration and comedy, like the great works of Lewis and Tolkien do. Like, that's why we read them, because they are speaking of wonderful things. And uh, this, this attack on the literature of freedom and dignity, I took this from B.F. Skinner. Do you know Skinner from psychology? He's a behaviorist, famous behaviorist psychologist. And he wrote this book called Beyond Freedom and Dignity as a direct response to C.S. Lewis, who he said was the best spokesman. He wrote this in 1968, was it? 1971. And said that C.S. Lewis was the best proponent in his day for the literatures of freedom and dignity, and he wanted to get beyond that. Now that's 1971. It's when literary theory is just starting to come to the fore, right at that point. Now he's not a literary theoretician, he is a psychologist. But he is coming at it from the social scientific point of view, and he wants to look at human nature not as something that has inherent dignity, not as something that fits a cosmological order, but as something that we are going to master and which we are going to determine. And we are going to determine in Skinner's uh, views, we're going to determine it to the point where we can control behavior and responses and the, the psychological uh, profession, occupation, has followed his path. Now, I call that, uh, it, it's a combination of transhumanism and posthumanism. I'll get to that next semester when we get to the contemporary views. But the transhumanists, briefly, are trying to take human nature and perfect it. The posthumanists are saying that there is no human nature and that we are no different than not only the animals, but a machine. There, there's no essential difference between them. We interconnect with them, we interact with both of them, and really there is no essential difference. We want, we want to get beyond the idea that there is a dignity and, and freedom to humanity which we will deny in other creatures. And that the environmental movement is a representative of, of post-humanism in that sense. But works of literature historically, and to my mind still to this day, at least good ones, they render a, a very imaginative and a coherent account of life which transforms people and I believe represents the dignity of mankind. And it's not just a Christian presupposition, we find it in the ancient Greeks. We find it in great Persian literature as well, Chinese literature for that matter. But the reflection on it has taken place in the West largely because of uh, the, the Greeks. And so I will start us off with a lecture on uh, Plato's Republic, extracts from it, and then move on to Aristotle's Poetics. So we'll start off with the pagan authors and what they say about the nature of literature. And uh, this will be our guide for it, this tree killer of a book. You can tell I'm not a romantic because I assign such monstrous tree killers of texts. Um, it, the reason I have it is it's actually useful for both semesters. So it's, it's big, but it actually is a pretty good source book I found over the years. So if you can acquire a copy at a reduced rate, by all means do it. You can also get them uh, independently if you wish. That's fine. 
Um, but my view of what literary theory is doing to literature is what I also observe it is doing to the humanities in general, and that is to kill them. The chief haters of the humanities are the professors of the humanities. They never found a, uh, a work of beauty, goodness, and truth that they did not hate and want to destroy. Or co-opt for some agenda other than taking delight in the foibles and the uh, indignity, but also the great dignity of humanity. They don't want to do that. They don't like what they do. They don't like literature. And I, don't, I won't do that to my students. Um, and um, I'm hoping that when you come through a degree here, you at least want to continue to read and take delight in what you originally took delight in. Right? Because I found going through grad school and so forth, I found that there were people who began loving literature. That's why they studied English to begin with. But by the end of it, they never wanted to open a book again because they couldn't stop. You know, when they're watching a movie, they're seeing it as a, oh, that was a terrible display of post-colonialism, wasn't there? You know, everything. It was taken from the vantage point of, you know, something. And so they couldn't enjoy anything anymore. That to me is a terrible thing. I mean, there's, there is a place for some of the theories, but if that's your starting point, you never have any ex uh, experience of great text, then you really don't know what you're miss missing and you immediately go to this uh, sort of contempt for liberal education. Because liberal education in its best sense, and Jordan Peterson has been quite outspoken on this, and rightly so, in its best sense, it humanizes people. It makes people better. Now, I don't mean better in the religious sense of a different sort of a human being, but it, it refines their tastes. It gives them a better sense of what is good and true and beautiful, and they, are worth, and they are willing to fight for it. And then they will defend that not only in the texts, but all around them. They will not uh, give way to the drowning of innocence around them, which is so much a part of our contemporary world. So I think it begins in academia. Uh, it is intensified under postmodern literary theories. And uh, the solution to it is a better literary theory, not the abandonment of literary theory. And the only way to do that is to go back and look into the deep resources of the Western tradition. So we start off with Plato and Aristotle, and then we move to uh, Longinus on sublimity, which is not hugely influential in the ancient world, but is hugely influential come the Renaissance. And even more so in the 18th century when the, the two categories of the sublime and the beautiful are the markers of literary discourse. You know, what constitutes a sublime text? And Longinus' text is one of the, the core texts that they refer to. As this is not hugely influential in the ancient world, but it is more influential later on, so we're almost reading him for what he becomes rather than what he is at the time. Uh, whereas Horace's Ars Poetica, the art of poetry, is a, a poet's observations about what constitutes poetic excellence. So he's not just a critic, but a great poet. And we will find on the course there are several uh, great critics who are also great poets. And that, that, there is a tradition of that in literature as well that goes through Philip, Sir Philip Sidney and on through uh, Wordsworth and the Romantics and even to T.S. Eliot. So the, some of the greatest poets are also some of the greatest critics. They have a real sense of it and their works are worth listening to. And we'll, we'll read many of those, but we'll go through that and then we'll have a seminar day. I'll give you more details about the seminar days when we, we come to it, but we'll break into groups and, and actually try and talk through some of the issues that have arisen on the course. Uh, so that will, at, on September 25th, that seminar day, that will, that will be the conclusion of the classical literary theory. And then we'll move into the Christian um, period and spend four classes on Augustine's on Christian doctrine, which I think is 
not only brilliant, but really, really useful in addressing many of the blind spots of contemporary lit theory. Now, it's called On Christian Doctrine, De Doctrina Christiana. It's about how to read the Bible. So you'll find it useful on that front as well. But I think what he says about reading the Bible applies to texts outside the Bible as well. Uh, I'll say more when we come to those, uh, that class. But we will look at precisely that and we'll talk about what, what we are doing when we are reading and what purpose reading should have and writing should have. It has a purpose. It isn't just because we like to write. I hear that from people who come to Tyndale. I want to learn to, I want to be a writer. Why? Because I like to write. Do other people like to read you? I, I rarely ask that question because it doesn't go over very well. But that, that ought to be a question that they, do other people like to read you? Well, what, what causes people delight? Now, delight can be broken down into entertainment and delight in the sense that it leads them to be a, a, to a profound reflection on human life and a profound sense of uh, human dignity. Are you able to do that? Are you able to write in such a way that that comes out in the writing? A good writer does that. And that is no easy thing to do. That is no easy thing to do. So to be a, a writer is a good thing. But it has to have the question of what does it mean? What is the responsibility of the writer? Because the writer does have a responsibility. By the way, in the Renaissance, they would have regarded the, uh, the writer and the playwright to have such awesome responsibility that, that they're effectively they're a teacher and should be subject to the same sort of uh, censure that teachers of the Bible would. There is a moral responsibility that goes with entertaining people. It's not just delight. There is a moral responsibility placed on not just teachers, but writers. So you can make your audience better. You can make your audience worse. But you will do one or the other. And how would we know what that was? So these are the sorts of questions that we will be looking at. We'll deal with them, I think, profoundly in Augustine. Uh, then the break and the first essay and then we'll have a seminar talking about Augustine primarily but also the literary theory of Jesus as I call it and his understanding of language because I will say I talked about the four causes and the initial cause if that's the author and the uh, material and the instrumental cause if that's the text and the final cause is the audience we're dealing with two things there we're, we're dealing with persons and words and in the person of Jesus we have the word of God who speaks words and his words are authoritative and he himself is the word but in the word of God who became flesh and lived among us was also the person the quintessential person he is the image of God we're made in the image of God he is the image of God what is it to use language the way Jesus used language and how do, when we use language rightly, how do we become more like Jesus? Those are the sorts of questions we're going to uh, delve into. Uh, we'll move from there, and we're moving chronologically through this. And now, having gone into the fifth century, we're going to jump all the way to, the, to Dante, uh, 1300 thereabouts, and his theory of uh, language and at this point we'll probably introduce the ideas of um, whether literature is to be read uh, allegorically or typologically or literally or allegorically there are two schools of thought on this in the ancient world one is marked by Antioch and the other by Alexandria two schools of how you read scripture and those two schools of how you read scripture were also how they read Homer. Because the early moralists in the Greek tradition could not accept that the gods were as Homer portrayed them. They lie, they cheat, they steal, they commit adultery. In fact, they are like the worst people, but they're immortal. How can this be? This is scandalous. This is not what the gods are like. Say, so say the philosophers. And so how can we read Homer, who we all regard as a cultural icon, without 
scandal? Well, we read it allegorically. So when he talks about the gods, these aren't really the gods. They represent certain other things. It's an allegory for something else. And that, that same thing happens with other literary texts and also with the Bible. We'll, we'll, we'll come to those uh, discussions as well. Then we'll go on to Sidney's great defense of, of poesy, which argues that the uh, preeminent discipline in the humanities is that of literature, which is correct, not philosophy, not history, but literature. It's an argument, by the way, which uh, would have been part of the classical trivium. Have you ever heard of Marshall McLuhan? The Medium is the Message, Canadian scholar, wrote a book on the classical trivium. It's his doctoral thesis from Cambridge University. Very interesting. Recovery of the liberal arts, very interesting, interested in uh, what Thomas Nash had to say about the uh, humanities, seeking to recover it, and that's right in the 60s. A uh, very interesting Canadian scholar. Uh, then we will move into the Reformation period. We'll look at a few uh, handouts. We won't go to the direct text here. We'll be a, a commentary on the text by Gerald Bruns, and I'll put those online for you. Um, talking about modernity and how it changes uh, the way in which texts are looked at as well. So I think you'll find it helpful. And then we'll move into the... Uh, Enlightenment period or the neoclassical period with Carnet and Addison and Johnson. So Renaissance to neoclassicism. We'll conclude that section with a seminar day and then we'll move on to the Romantic period with Kant, Burke, Wordsworth, Coleridge and Keats. Uh, who are in our day uh, regarded as the chief spokesman for literary theory. So the, the romantics tend to be, but I think we'll see by looking at the beginning of literary theory that really they're reacting against, our, but they're also in conversation with dialogues that have been taking place for millennia. They're joining that conversation themselves. They have their own point of view on it. You may agree with them, you may disagree with them. By the end of the course, you may not be with me and you may agree with them. And I'll fail you if you do that. Um, no, I'm serious. I'll tell you if you do that. Um, no, of course you can agree with them. But at the point, but that point, you will at least have a sense that they are engaging with their predecessors. And they're, they're, uh, Wordsworth has actually read his, his forebears here. And when he talks about the uh, certain terminology, he is thinking of Sidney. And he is thinking of what Aristotle said. And he read them in school. And of course he's thinking that, and he expects his audience to have read that as well. And so he'll be, you'll be able to engage and decide, is Wordsworth's innovation on literary theory, is it a good one or is it problematic? It's easier for us to see that because we've got 200 years of hindsight. Well, we can see, well, what are the consequences of romantic hermeneutics? Um, and there are some good ones, but uh, there are also some pretty devastating ones. So modern literary theory by the way, there's a reason why 19th century is the, the classical period seen in your bookstore. So if you go to the bookstore and the classical texts are 19th century, that's because our contemporary understanding of the humanities and ourselves is rooted in romantic premises. We assume that they're correct. When I say we, the establishment assumes that the romantics are correct. It just assumes. And in my experience, uh, they, have, they have not read the text that you are going to read on this course. Because in lit theory, you don't do these texts. I mean, it's in the Norton Anthology, but I can tell you if you do this at most universities, they will skip over the first two thirds of it to get to the contemporary stuff. And they probably wouldn't choose this one even. But if they did, uh, they would focus on the contemporary stuff to the great uh, they're a great detriment, I think. So I think you'll find that helpful. Even more helpful is when you take this course and then take the next one and say, okay, from what we got there, let's now see where contemporary literary theories depart from the path of, I will say, righteousness. But, um, but also coherent presentations of what a text is, what an author is, and what an audience is. Because by the time you get to the 1960s, 
uh, uh, one famous French theorist proclaims the death of the author. There is no such thing as an author. We can't know who the author is or what the author thought. All we have is the text. We can only access the author's thoughts through the text. We don't know the author's intentions. In fact, there is no author. He's overstating the case, obviously, because you don't get a text without an author. It's like a, it's an egg without a chicken, right? But effectively, we have the text and we don't know what the author's intentions are, and it's a fruitless endeavor to try and recapture what the author's intentions were or what the, the audience's intentions are. That's also irrelevant. So it's removed human nature from the reading of the text. It just becomes a technical exercise. Um, so there are challenges with that. Not, I think by giving you both semesters, at least at the end of that, you'll have a sense of what's going on in your churches. Because I, I will say right now, and this is my observation from the very get-go when I was a Christian convert in my late 20s, that contemporary literary theory has seeped in through the seminaries and they present literary theories that they don't understand at which have radically subversive effects on the reading of the text and on, as a consequence on the spiritual lives of their congregations. They undermine the authority of the word of God because they don't believe that there is a word of God. There is no such thing. The Bible is no longer the word of God. This is the word of men. And we don't know the intentions of the authors. We know that they come from certain cultural contexts. They had certain presuppositions. We happen not to share them. And we can happily do what the Romantics did and use our spiritual reading of scripture, which may be different than the Apostle Paul's. And the reason we can do that is because we have the Holy Spirit. So they will blaspheme against the Holy Spirit there as well. But that will get me too far off topic to go into that for now. I will do that later in great detail and with great relish and vim and vigor, I assure you. But that is more or less the course. The evaluation is pretty clear. I got two essays as usual and an exam. The exam might be an oral exam, which is a unique sort of torture, which I particularly enjoy. Um, but we'll see. It has the beauty of brevity. It's 20 minutes and you're done. I can usually discern more or less. And it's just a conversation. It's, it's anyway, but we'll, we'll talk about that. I'm not, uh, a written exam works for me as well. We can talk about it. So that's it. And then everything else I believe is more or less boilerplate stuff. Uh, other than I should say, I now have a YouTube channel. How about that? I think. Does it actually work? Yeah, there it goes. Um, and it, I'm, what I'm going to do with that is this lecture, which I'm recording here, it's going to go up on the YouTube channel. And I will try and, because my sense is what I am saying in my class is almost heard nowhere else, obviously because it's my stuff and it's unique, but I actually think that I have something to say about these things and I would like it to reach a broader audience. But also I would like you to be able to um, access it and go back and, um, you know, what, what did he say there exactly? So I, I don't mean, I don't allow for laptops or any of that sort of thing. If you really want the complete picture, well, it'll be online and you can go there and, and then this will be note taking and processing on your part. Well, what are the big questions? Like there are certain things I want you to write down, but it's not everything I say. It's really not worth that. Um, it really isn't. So that's the new thing. What the heck's going on? Oh, there's me. Okay. So that's that. That's the new thing. And um, I'm trying to uh, utilize the internet. I'm a bit technophobic. But um, I'm thinking that this is a good thing to do and uh, to reach a broader audience, part of my vocation as a Christian academic to do that. So questions from that? Comments? The Augustine work is a separate work. It's a short one on Christian doctrine. I hope you have a chance to read it. If you haven't read it yet, I would encourage you to read it because it's pretty dense and rich as well though it's really i think you'll find it changes your bible reading and not just your bible reading 
So I spent the summer working on that text and also Augustine's work on the Trinity and also Augustine's confessions and his idea of language. And because he's going to argue about the difference between the mind and the word. So what we think and what we speak are two different things. We say what's on our minds. Yes, but the two are not the same. So how can Jesus be the word of God and yet be God? It's a Trinitarian issue for Augustine. But it's also for us, it's an, it, it deals with these issues of intentionality. So we think one thing and we intend one thing and then we write one thing. How does what we write relate to what we intend? And how does that reflect who we are? And how does that relate to the Imago Dei? You know, we're, it says in Genesis 1, 26 to 28 that we're made in the image of God. What does that exactly mean? It's not, it's not stated there in that text. It's just stated as a fact. We are made in the image of God. Okay, but what does that mean exactly? It also says that Jesus is the image of God. We're made in the image of God. He is the image of God. So he's not in, he is. And what, how do we, we relate to the word of God, the person who is the word, who declares God's innermost counsels, who not only declares them, but lives them out, represents them in his life. He is, there's an integrity there, there's no contradiction, and yet people hate him for it. All these things are uh, rich things to think about, and we'll try and at least scratch the surface on that here. So questions or comments? And if not, we'll just pick it up next time. But I am done for the first day. Short and sweet. Longer than usual, actually. Yes? I was reading, uh, like, so just like some historical theory, just this book, because I, I like the idea of just like different theories. But um, like for, like, let's say if you find, like, uh, let's say Marxist theory, mm -hmm. that really helps to explain, like, our, like the industrial complex of our world like isn't it good to just have some of these to kind of ex explain it like there's different classes in our world and one class does this one class where it like helps to simplify such a big arch of history kind of like yeah no i mean the reason that literary theories are appealing in general is because they give us a a rubric or a worldview to interpret things by it gives us a bigger picture so here's a text but how do i understand this one text in in a broader context and Marx has a, a narrative for that mm -hmm. it's not a very flattering one for literary text that this is the product of the bourgeoisie basically so it, it, the interest in liberal education is a bourgeois interest it's not really of interest to Marx per se and in general Marxist literary critics have no place for literature they're not interested in it it's good for burning it makes good firewood it burns well and it heats you, but there, uh, Marx was a materialist. Uh, cultural Marxists, on the other hand, re re realized that Marx uh, had some shortcomings and that he ignored culture. And so they brought Marxist presuppositions to text and they did things with it. And so cultural Marxism, I think, was hugely involved in the productions of Hollywood and so forth. You can see the playing out of that. And I've written on this and spoken on it publicly before. Uh, Jordan Peterson's also talked about cultural Marxism now, and I think it is in the universities, but that's not quite what Marx says. It's, it's, a, it's a people who would call themselves Marxists, but they don't share his sheer contempt for culture. They think actually culture is really important. Now, I'll come to that next semester when I talk about cultural Marxism. Uh, talk unto itself. But yes, it is helpful. My question is, is it, is it true? And does it account for the, all of the evidence that I see in human nature? And I regard it as a school of suspicion, just like Freud has a school of suspicion, and so does uh, Nietzsche. Um, the, three, th the three masters of suspicion, as Paul Ricoeur calls them, calls them. They have a certain contempt, suspicion for everything that is not utilitarian. Anything that can't be used for feeding is they regard as, well, this is what, 
It's like religion, it's the opium of the masses. Literature, it's the opium of the masses. You do this to trick people into getting, they're taking their eye off the ball and what's really important. What's really important is controlling the means of production and the, the equal society where everybody has equ total equality. That's, that's the aim. All this talk about literature and about God, this is, you know, this is off topic. Let's stick, let's stick with our knitting here and stick to what really matters. Let's get down to that and what that is, is about, as I say, material wealth. So Marx reduces everything to uh, wealth. Freud reduces it all to sex and Nietzsche to will, the will to power. Everything's a function of that. And the naturalists of the 19th century do something similar. And I would say, again, this man, B.F. Skinner, is going down that path. They're all reductionist theories, which I will try and expose as such. So reductionist in the sense that they reduce what human nature is. They reduce us as human beings. If we accept them, they lead to terrible consequences, but ultimately they don't even account for all the evidence. So I'm not going to argue it as a, as a social theorist. I'm going to talk about it as an academic and break it down in how I think it's a, it's a narrow way of looking at things. It doesn't account for the full picture of what a, a distinctively human being is. There's no doubt that we share certain things in common with animals, many things. But there are some things we do not, and if we ignore those things, we do at our peril. We do so at our peril. Anyway, yes. But the bashing goes on next semester. And it gets more challenging. When you deal with contemporary stuff, it's, it's more difficult because they're closer to you. You don't really have the benefit of distance and, uh, and uh, objectivity. Whereas things that were written in past ages, you can see, that's really interesting. I never thought of that. Or that, like, that's ridiculous. That's like what, whereas contemporary stuff, people really are passionately advocating for this point of view. And by even engaging with it, how dare you question this? Like, how dare you? You get into immediate personal, interpersonal conflict. And one of the, my, my hope of the benefits of looking at the course in a historical way is to say, okay, well, never mind what Masson says about this. What, what would Aristotle say about this subject? What would, how would Augustine, if we looked at what Augustine, when he talks about a text, and we get a postmodern uh, critical theorist of the feminist art, and what she says here, what, well, that's very interesting, but what, what would Aristotle say about that in relation to these things? That, uh, that sort of detaches it and makes it a little bit less heated, and that's helpful, I think. Anyway, and at the end of it all, I will not fail you for siding with the romantics. I'll just dislike you. <laughs> but then you'll dislike me by that point as well, so it won't matter. And I can live with that anyway. Uh, and your grade will not be affected by my dislike. At least I hope and intend. Uh, any other questions or comments? And if not, I shall see you next time. Oh, oh, else? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, for mm -hmm. Republic extract, so what do, what do yeah, it's not here, right? So I, I'll throw them up online. So today's Wednesday. There'll, there'll be. It's Monday where we'll deal with that, right? Mm -hmm. It's first play, yeah. So I will put the extracts. The extracts are going to be from book seven and book 10. So the allegory of the cave, and then in book 10, I, I'll give it a bit, a bit of a broader context as well, but in book 10, uh, Plato argues that the poet should be thrown out of his ideal polis, city-state. Why does he say that? Because it's a, if you look at the context, Homer is called the teacher of all Greece, like all of the Greek city-states, whether they're Athens or Sparta or Corinth or whatever, they all regard Homer as more or less the Bible. They go to Homer. They love Homer. Plato says that the poet should be thrown out, and he, has, he must have Homer in mind when he says this. Well, this is an extraordinary thing to say. Why does he say this? And it, it, because it's a famous statement as well. Like People in general in the literary field like Plato. They love Plato. What do they do with the fact that Plato would have them out? Of, right? So what is his view of literature at that point? And is it only a commentary on Homer and the place of Homer in Greek civic life? Or is it a broader comment on literature and how poets never tell the truth? 
they always lie because they don't know what the truth is because they've never explored what the truth is. That's what we'll be looking at. Okay, so if you've got books 7 and 10, by all means read them. If not, I will put the extracts, or even if you do, I'll still put them up on the course website. Okay, and I don't think they're in here. I think we have something from Plato's Ion, which is also interesting, but it's on the issue of inspiration, which is more of a romantic concern. And uh, I don't want to assign both of them, so we'll stick with the Republic. Okay? Is that good? Anything else? If not, we're done. And I shall see you next class. <laughs>